Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Uh, we begin by welcoming the Central Coast Recorder Society. And uh, lovely to have you in our worship service. And we uh, enjoy every time you come and, and play for us on a Sunday morning. Uh, this morning, as we uh, enter into our time of worship, just uh, a few quick announcements. One is that Jan Fadden, our parish nurse, is here and will be available following our worship service to answer questions and provide health checks. Um, the log sale was yesterday, and uh, I'm happy to report that uh, they, they brought in um, over $4,100, but uh, along with that, there is still more opportunity to, to uh, following our worship service this morning. So I encourage you to, to go over after worship and, and uh, find something wonderful and support our, our log students. Uh, along with that as well, there was a, uh, a plant sale, um, a succulent sale, and um, they brought in, uh, probably by the end of today, it'll be over, over $400 in plant sales. And so uh, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so Easter, Holy Week, everything is, is just around the corner. And with all that coming up, um, pay close attention to all the, the various uh, Holy Week activities we have, uh, including our Monday, Thursday soup dinner. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, signing up to provide soup, for that in particular, uh, you can sign up on uh, the patio. And for our Easter brunch, uh, Catherine McFadden will be on the patio and, and she is looking for volunteers to help set up on Saturday as well as to, to help uh, with the, the setup and logistics on, on Sunday uh, following our worship service. And so uh, please talk to her on the patio following worship. Um, you will see uh, information for the, the potluck brunch uh, inside your, your bulletin. And uh, you also see uh, information on one great hour of sharing, one of uh, our denomination's uh, special offerings uh, that we participate in throughout the year. And Deb Arts will be uh, talking to us during our worship service about that in, in a little bit. Well, let us uh, rise in body or spirit and uh, join together in the call to worship. And so I want to invite Lauren Rolfe to come forward and lead us. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? Have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in all your statutes, and the one I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of praise.
Be seated. Be Isaiah 55 declares, Come, all you are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Considering God's abundance grace, let us pray, first silently and then with the words printed in the bulletin. Gracious God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We long to earn our salvation on our own terms, forgetting that you have loved us since we were born. Forgive us because we do not trust you completely. We do not follow you wholeheartedly. We confess that we cling to old patterns and worldly ways. Scripture reveals your mercy, O Lord. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities.
I invite Deb Arts to come forward to talk to us about one great hour of sharing. And as she comes forward, uh, Miranda's going to put a video on about the one great hour of sharing. In 1946, Bishop Henry Knox Sherrill of the Episcopal Church set an audacious goal of raising one million dollars in one hour for world relief. One year later, the former UPCUSA and the PCUS, predecessor denominations of the Presbyterian Church USA, joined in, followed by several other denominations in 1949. The heart of this initiative was the desire to help those in need, including disaster relief, refugee assistance, and development aid. Today, the One Great Hour of Sharing stands as the single largest way that Presbyterians come together to bring their first fruits to benefit God's world. Over the years, countless lives have been transformed and hope rekindled through the work of the One Great Hour of Sharing. For over seven decades, this initiative has been vital in restoring hope, rebuilding dreams, and empowering communities to create a world that reflects God's love. It has served as a tangible expression of our thanks for all that God gives us and an opportunity to share our blessings with others. As we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the One Great Hour of Sharing, we look forward to the bright future ahead. We continue to strive to make a difference in the world and to bring hope to those who are in need. So on this special occasion, let us rededicate ourselves to this sacred call and with joyful hearts continue to give generously. Well, thank you, Miranda, for finding that video that speaks volumes for th this special offering. As, as we know, uh, our church uh, gives three times a year, and this month is called the One Great Hour of Sharing. And as you saw in the video, uh, there's three parts to the offering that is collected nationally including our branch. And as you saw in the video, I, you know, I evidently 32% goes to disaster relief. And as we know, Don has participated. When I was at a conference not too long ago for a mission, I ran into Susan, who was uh, doing work in Hawaii, in Lahaina. Uh, after the f devastating fire there. And it reminded me of so much intensification of disasters, both in our country and abroad, given ch the climate change changes we're seeing now. So that is so critical. The hunger program, starvation prevails, and uh, that that is given 30, <laughs> 36%, and then finally, self-development. This invests in communities responding to their experience of oppression, poverty, and injustice. And uh, so you can see that if you were to <laughs> look inside your bulletin, there's a little envelope, and you can use that to put anything that you'd like we have till the end of the month, so you can also bring it next week. And um, I'd like to just uh, thank you for your attention and this really special opportunity for us to come together and uh, provide with this an amazing work that's being done in, in the world. So let's close with prayer. Help us, Lord, to delight in you, O oh God, that we might become agents of healing and hope, repair and restoration, transform our brokenness and fear into justice and mercy, and bless our work to share your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now may the peace of Christ be with you. Well, let us share Christ's peace with one another.
Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. They came to Jericho as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Far Timaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting on the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this text in, in Mark's gospel, uh, this, this healing of Bartimaeus marks uh, a significant transition. Uh, Mark uses this particular text as as a, a signpost, a moment to move from Jesus teaching his disciples, forming them and instructing them, and it provides the shift from that to Jesus confronting authorities and ultimately setting them on the course to his crucifixion. So next week, if, if we are going through Mark's gospel, next week, the text immediately following this is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which um, unsurprisingly uh, coincides with Palm Sunday being next Sunday. But because this is a transitional text, because uh, Mark is, is trying to teach his readers something very specific we recognize that while this is a, a miracle story, a, a, a story of Jesus healing someone, it takes a slightly different form than many of Jesus' other miracles. And I, I've said this many times. I've said it in, in Bible study. I'm sure I've said it from the pulpit before that uh, the gospel writers in particular share uh, these stories not uh, in very specific ways, not just because they want to tell you everything that happened, but because the people they are talking to needed to hear certain aspects of the story over others. And so they, depending on who they are communicating to, they might emphasize um, how this person was healed, or in this case, kind of other things surrounding what is happening in Bartimaeus' life. And so Mark is really concluding and kind of summarizing, bringing together everything that has been happening with the disciples. Now, I've mentioned before that in Mark's Gospels, uh, in Mark's Gospel, Mark oftentimes shows the disciples as, as struggling to understand, as not quite getting it, and then others understanding and, and uh, really getting it, grasping what Jesus is up to when the people closest to him are not. And uh, Bartimaeus, in many ways, uh, kind of summarizes that. So he is uh, a blind beggar, somebody in a position of, um, of, of brokenness, of, uh, of, of great need. Um, I, you know, we, we hesitate to use some of this terminology today when we talk about people with particular ailments because um, we want to see them in their full humanity, but within the world of the first century. Um, if you were limited in some capacity, that meant you were limited to provide for yourself or for your family. And so if you're blind, 
or if you uh, were unable to walk, if you were unable to be full-bodied in the sense of, of working, then, then you were utterly dependent upon uh, the world around you to provide you anything that you might need. And that often meant simply begging for it. That meant uh, really appealing for just the scraps of the world around you. And so Bartimaeus is in this position. We don't know uh, a whole lot else. We don't know other things about him. And we don't hear speculation as to why he was blind, uh, which is helpful, I think, in this context. Because I think Mark, in some ways, is using Bartimaeus' blindness to talk about spiritual blindness or other ailments that are a part of the human condition. Things that, for instance, we might experience in our own lives that prevent us from fully seeing or recognizing who Jesus is. But Bartimaeus knows his limitations and desires greatly to be healed from them, to be made whole. And so he cries out when he knows that he is in proximity to Jesus. And he's in a position where he doesn't, he, you know, he can't see, but he knows if he's nearby, I'm going to make myself known. I'm going to cry out. I'm going to be persistent so that Jesus will hear me and Jesus will heal me. And we hear that as he cries out, Jesus, son of David, which is an important proclamation because it is a recognition that Jesus is the Messiah. To call him son of David is a, a profound statement. And up until this point, it would be the kind of statement where Jesus would say, you need to be quiet. <laughs> it's not time for people to hear that yet. But instead, we hear people say, be quiet, and we get the sense that it isn't because he is saying son of David, but because he's just being annoyingly loud and kind of disrupting whatever is unfolding. That your desire to encounter Jesus is interfering with our plans. This isn't how it's supposed to go. Uh, we see this oftentimes uh, that the disciples and others around Jesus kind of decide for Jesus, okay, this is what we need to be doing, this is where we need to be going, and anything else is going to be a distraction from it. But I love that Bartimaeus will not take, um, be quiet for an answer, and he cries out even louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And this is where we get to the really important part of this text because as I've mentioned before there isn't punctuation in in scripture in the Greek and in the Hebrew there's there's no punctuation um, it, because of the economy of space uh, and just because of how people wrote at the time uh, when you when you look at manuscripts from from the first century it is just a string of letters as as much as they can pack into a line and then it just continues on. And so the only way to know how things kind of break up is to simply be, be literate enough um, to, to hear it out loud, hear the flow of the words and say, okay, this is a sentence and this is a sentence and this is a sentence. But because of that, Folks like Mark had other ways of showing us what was important. And so when things are repeated in scripture, in particular threefold repetitions, are ways that writers use to underline and circle things that otherwise you, you couldn't do. And so Jesus stood still and, sa and said, call him here. That's our first call. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. Really quickly, we have these three calls. And Mark is saying, this is, 
This is what this story is about. It is about Jesus calling people, calling disciples. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. He responds to Jesus' call in his life. Jesus asks, what can I do for you? Um, it's one of those moments where I, mean, I think in the Gospels we understand Jesus totally knows what's going on, but, but the question always needs to be asked. What do you want me to do for you? And he says, my teacher, let me see again. And so Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. We, don't, uh, we hear that immediately his sight is regained, but we don't get this emphasis on his blindness being the most important thing happening here. But he's made whole. Jesus has heard his cries, has called him to him, has said, your faith, your faith has made you well. We are told he regained his sight immediately and even more importantly, he followed him. Mark finishes this section of his gospel by saying the work or the, the life of a disciple is to cry out. It is to recognize that you are in need of something to call out to Jesus. And when Jesus calls you, just as he called his disciples, just as he calls people to follow him, you respond. And what I love here is that Jesus makes him whole first. Now, Jesus doesn't say, uh, though the church for 2,000 years has kind of struggled with this, but Jesus doesn't say, come follow me, and then along the way, if you're good enough, or if you follow me just right, or if you learn just enough, then you will regain your sight. Then you will become whole again. Jesus makes him whole, and out of that wholeness, he can do nothing but follow Jesus. And Mark is simply saying, this is it. This is what it means to be a disciple. To respond to God's call, to, to have faith, and to allow Jesus to make you whole. And that wholeness while very dramatic in this text, takes on a, a different life in, in each of our lives in very individual ways, in very specific ways. But it's something that at times happens all at once and at times unfolds in this slow and, and beautiful way throughout our lives. And yet... And yet it is always the same, that Jesus hears us and responds to us and calls us and loves us. And what a wonderful and important thing to recognize and, and dwell upon as we make this final shift in our season of Lent, as Mark makes this final shift to this confrontation that will take place with the religious authorities, with those who are upset with Jesus and uncomfortable with what he is doing. To recognize that, that to follow Jesus is to embrace God's work in the world, even if it upsets others even if the road that it leads down isn't always um, comfortable or safe. Um, it's always at the same time filled with, with God's presence and with God's joy. And so as we enter into uh, a celebratory time, but also uh, a contemplative and a somberful time, this final portion of Lent. We do so 
joining with Bartimaeus, saying, here I am, saying, I want to follow, saying, heal me. Restore my eyesight so that I might see everything that you want me to see, so that I might see my neighbor in different lights, so I might see the world in new ways, so that I might see you, Jesus, for who you are, the Son of God, the great healer, the Savior of the world. Amen. Let's remain seated as we sing our hymn of response, Christ is made the sure foundation. time I invite our ushers to come forward as we pretend present <laughs> Ooh, that was a fun slip our tithes gifts and offerings
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you and praise you for everything that we have. And so as we present our tithes, gifts, and offerings, as we offer of ourselves, we pray for your blessing to be upon these are tithes, gifts, and offerings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. These are the prayers of the people. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the gifts that we have received in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that through him we have been given new life. And pray that you would continue to overflow in our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. We come before you in prayer and praise with weary hearts because we are surrounded by so much need. Lord, in a world filled with division, in a world filled with so much tension, with war, famine, with so much brokenness around us, we pray for your will to be done. We pray for your healing hand to be upon our nation and upon all the nations of the world. We pray this day earnestly that your peace would be made known. O oh Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to the ways in which we can be agents of your peace and your grace this day. Lord, we lift up those who are sick and suffering and we pray for healing of their mind, body, and spirit. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you have gifted others for the sake of healing. And so we pray that you'd continue to work through doctors, nurses, and many other healthcare providers. Oh Lord, continue to bind us together as your people that, that we might proclaim to the world your goodness. And Lord, we thank you once again for your son Jesus, in whose name we pray and with whose words we continue to pray. Praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Gracious to you, Lord. 
As we go out this day, let us go out once again responding to Jesus' call in our lives. And so go with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.